Now let me uh, introduce our featured author of, of the session. And uh, that is uh, William Shea. He goes by Bill. So Bill is <coughs> coming to us from Neuchâtel, Switzerland. So Bill, would you like to say hello? Real privilege for me to you know be with you and, uh, yeah. and the great journal that you have. I think it's, it plays a crucial role. You know, I, Thank you. I tend to uh, read the books that are reviewed in your journal because one knows what to read. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's a great feature of it. So well, first of all, uh, Bill, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? I understand you're from Canada. Yes, I was born in Canada, and uh, I studied at the University of Ottawa. Then I went and I did a degree in theology in Rome, and uh, went on to Cambridge. Mm -hmm. Then was a fellow at Harvard for for a year. Um, then I taught at McGill, okay. and subsequently at the uh, University of Strasbourg in France. Wow, you're really tricked. And tri one day someone telephoned me and said, Bill, do you want the Galileo chair in Padua? Wow. <laughs> so I knew if I said no, within two minutes, someone else would say yes. So I, <laughs> That's great. Now, had, had you... Uh... I, I gave the right answer and went to Italy and really had that Here anybody. marvelous 10 years there. Yeah, that's, that's great. Enjoyable. So um, I, did, did you teach in Italian or in English? Uh, <laughs> well, <laughs> some people would say I spoke in Italian, yes. <laughs> <laughs> some people would do no, it. I, that's I, great. I, I acquired a, a working knowledge. Uh, uh -huh. It's so, always very difficult to write in a foreign language, but uh, right. I, so, I had the help of one of my assistants. And, no, I lectured in Italian. That's great. So <laughs> when, when you were... <laughs> more comfortable. <laughs> When you were offered that job, had you already written some books on Galileo? Is that why? Yes, uh, I had uh, written some books on Galileo, and I, I published a number of books on the scientific revolution mm -hmm. and the history yeah. of science, so, mainly astronomy and physics and okay. some chemistry. So how and when did you get interested in Galileo? Well, you know, I asked myself at one point... Uh, <laughs> how did this new science really start? And the standard answer was, well, with people like Galileo and Newton. So I said, well, I might as well read Galileo. And of course, found not only that his science was fascinating, but that his uh, problems uh, uh, with uh, uh, the interpretation of the Bible and the ecclesiastical authorities was also some considerable importance. So I started doing that and uh, submitted my doctoral dissertation at Cambridge and then went back to Canada to teach at McGill and subsequently when, arrived in Italy. Yeah, <laughs> back that's to great. My base. <laughs> you never regretted it. it. Randy, I'll be quite honest. It was just curiosity. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's great. Oh, that's super. Uh, well, it's it's uh, uh, it's great to get to know you better, and I th I want to go back to Ari for a few minutes, and then uh, I'll let uh, Ari interrogate you a little. But uh, Ari, tell me how you got to know Bill and how you picked this book to review. Yeah, how did I stumble onto this book? Yeah, that's it, it's in a rather roundabout fashion. Uh, I asked Don Yerksa a friend who was former editor of Fideus at Historia, to consider re reviewing a book by Maurice Fionarchi and, entitled On Trial for Reason, Science, Religion, and Culture in the Galileo Affair. Mm -hmm. Don said, look, you got to approach Bill Shea. He's the Galileo scholar who knows, who Don knew very, very well. I had met Bill in Oxford in, in the UK about 20 years ago uh, during a Templeton funded seminar. And I'd read his book with uh, Mariano Ardigas entitled Galileo in Rome. So I thought I'll approach Bill and, and tell him that Don Yerksa recommended him. 
So he could never say no to that suggestion. But he did write a review, a wonderful review that got published in the June 2020 issue. And then he had his publisher send me a copy of Conversations with Galileo, which I then reviewed for the journal. So you see, it's kind of a roundabout way. Yeah. And being a review editor means that sometimes it, it takes this sort of journey before I find a reviewer. But this time I found the right person. <laughs> yeah, you did. Well, it's a great review and, and caught a lot uh, the interest no, of a lot very of us. Generous review. What what Harry hasn't mentioned is that I had uh, the pleasure and I, I must add the privilege of uh, meeting this young uh, cohort uh, in Oxford and giving a few lectures. It was one of these instances when the professor learns more from his students <laughs> the yeah. students learn from the professor. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It was a fascinating yeah. experience to meet. Uh, yeah. That's uh, great. Around 20 uh, professors from Christian institutions who mm -hmm. were interested in this issue. It was one of the, I mean, I go back to Oxford quite uh, frequently, but mm -hmm. I have not quite frankly, met such an interesting group. <laughs> That's super. In the last 20 years. <laughs> yeah. Well, what, what we'd like to do um, today during this hour is um, just take the title of your book literally and have some conversations with Galileo. And, and uh, you make a, a wonderful Galileo, slightly different attire, but it's, it's, it's quite there. So I'm going to turn this over to Ari and, and uh, I'll give him a chance to ask Galileo a few questions, and then later <clears throat> we've got a few people who've already submitted questions. I'll, I'll uh, read those off, and then we'll kind of open it up to all of you, uh, where through various means, uh, say uh, in the chat or something, you indicate you want to ask a question, and we'll try to keep up with everything and give you all a chance to uh, ask Galileo in person just what's going on. So Ari, why don't you take it from here? Okay. Uh, Randy actually actually asked the first question that I was going to ask. Oh, sorry that about was, that. Bill, what interested you in Galileo? Why this deep, deep interest in Galileo and not Descartes or, or Newton, for example? And I think I stumbled on the answer when you spoke. There's this quote in your book with uh, the book Galileo in Rome, in Rome in the introduction. You say, the Galileo affair remains as fascinating as ever and it has much to teach us. We believe it is the first step in a proper assessment of the relations between science and religion. So that's what I wanted to ask you first, but I think you've partially answered that question. What's your interest in Galileo, how it began, and perhaps how it continued for so many years. I don't know whether you want to speak to that further before I ask you a question, ask Galileo. You know, it's rather interesting to say, perhaps I can come back to one point, uh, you know, as, as someone when I was a student uh, uh, asked me, so Galileo was uh, the first scientist to be condemned by the church. <laughs> and then I said, well, I, it's interesting, I knew that, but can you tell me who was the second one? <laughs> So uh, <laughs> he hesitated and said, uh, well, uh, I really don't know. So then I was inspired, I think inspired, to say that proves that the church can learn something. <laughs> you know, it's a, a very dramatic incident which um, compelled uh, the Roman Catholic Church to over a period of time, um, review the way uh, they handle scriptures. Uh, one of the great uh, tragedies of that period is that uh, whereas we have uh, the King James Bible, this marvelous translation that at my age I'm still allowed to, to read <laughs> uh, because uh, one memorized so much from it, and modern translations are helpful, but it's nice to have a quotation ready for one's own use. And the Italians had, uh, surprisingly enough, a translation 
that my colleagues who are experts in Italian literature tell me is outstanding. I've actually read it myself. A translation made during Galileo's lifetime by someone called Diodati, who had left his native city, Luca, uh, to go to Genova, uh, and there became a professor of Hebrew. And this uh, marvelous translation uh, was banned by the church. Uh, so I think the real tragedy is not Galileo's condemnation. <laughs> it is the fact that this great marvelous, really truly outstanding translation was not made available for a period of over 100 years. Uh, it was distributed uh, in Galileo's day by the British ambassador, Button, who uh, smuggled copies into Venice and Padua. Uh, in, in a sense, the, the history of that period is fascinating. And uh, I was, I think, greatly attracted by the dialectical unfolding of these problems. Not that I ever came up with an entirely satisfactory solution, of course. Okay, Galileo, I want to go back now. You're a student. You're interested in going to the university. You don't know quite what area to go into. And you know full well that professors are not paid all that well. So thinking as an American student, why would you go to the university? Why would, what interests you? What do you see as your future? Uh, what, what drove you to become a student and look for a position in particularly mathematics when you're perhaps the least well-paid faculty member? <laughs> yes, you know, it, it, it's interesting when you, <clears throat> ponder this because uh, you know, students ask us these practical questions. Well, Galileo actually uh, would have liked to become a painter. Yeah. He, he was very gifted and uh, his friends throughout his lifetime were not his university colleagues. Uh, they were painters. Uh, this is an interesting consideration at psychological level. So his father said, look, uh, you're, uh, you're not so bad at doing this, but you know, there are a lot of painters, or young people who are much better than you are, but uh, they tell me that at school, you're, you're very good at mathematics. And uh, if you uh, start doing that, uh, you'll probably get a steady job. So <laughs> Galileo, instead of going on to become a painter, uh, became a professor of mathematics. And he turned out to be, of course, very gifted uh, for that kind. But it was, if I may say so, his father's choice. Ah, interesting. Interesting. Now, this Galileo... happens today, I would imagine, <laughs> occasionally. Yes. Galileo, you're, you're a fairly prick, prickly character. You provoke, you use literary genre to, 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 to write. For example, in the uh, two world systems, you use a dialogic uh, literary device. You have three people, Salviato, who represents Galileo, I understand, Sagredo and Simplicio. Why do you choose these particular literary devices to advance your argument? Well, I think that um, talking to um, people who read Galileo, what they, they remember was uh, the dialogue. It was not an uncommon form during okay. the day. I mean, uh, my colleagues who study Italian literature uh, tell me that it was uh, something that Galileo did, but in an absolutely marvelous way. You know, there is something very... Uh, is, interesting in this, this literary gift that he had, able to uh, stimulate reflection and be amusing. And uh, it, it is a literary masterpiece. Mm -hmm. And um, since I've been translating it, I've 
realize how difficult it is to render it <laughs> in another language. One uh, loses so much of the wit and wisdom, but uh, there we are. So uh, Galileo uh, also had, as I said, he was, his friends were mainly painters, but also writers. And some important Italian writers at the time would send them their manuscripts and ask him to comment on it. It's um, perhaps less known that he, he was quite generous in, in doing this. And uh, so he was interested in a variety of, of subjects and topics, uh, not only in uh, astronomy or mechanics, but also in painting. He was also quite generous in helping painters, uh, particularly uh, women who were painters. I mean, he helped at least two of them sell their paintings to the Grand Duke and vouching for their outstanding quality. <laughs> so that, that's uh, something uh, worth, worth recalling, I think. Yes. Yeah, one of the things that struck me in reading your book is the humanness, the, the human situations that Galileo gets in. For example, money matters. You know, he has to take care of the dowries of his sister. He's worried about his brother. He's worried about paying his father's debts after his father passes away. Uh, yeah, the, uh, all these financial issues seem to yes, me. Yes, yes. I, yeah, I, I, never expect, I never expected to read anything like that about Galileo. Well, uh, what is interesting, one tries to understand the, uh, the life of uh, that particular individual one has to enter into the, the period in which they lived. And people got married uh, at a certain uh, well-to-do families. Uh, they, they had to pay dowries. And uh, Galileo's father uh, ran out of money. <laughs> and his brother, uh, who was a musician, uh, had a large family and could not help Galileo. So Galileo was uh, compelled to pay uh, the uh, two gentlemen who married his two sisters. Uh, that uh, was uh, almost more than he could afford. But fortunately, when he went uh, to um, Padua, he got an important uh, increase, uh, which enabled him to do that. And then he himself became a money lender. <laughs> and the interesting thing is that the contracts he made have survived. And uh, in one instance, uh, he needed money and uh, asked the university to give him a one year advance in the salary. Now, I don't know if this is practiced in the United States, but I do not know of any country that would give a professor a one-year advance in salary. So the university wanted to keep him, and they said, okay, but you will have to have some guarantee. He went to an Aristotelian professor, therefore some of you did not agree with his astronomy, by the name of Cremonini, who actually said, look, we do not agree about the nature of the universe, but we agree on the nature of friendship. I will sign this paper guaranteeing that if you can't pay, I will pay the full amount back to the university. Interesting, isn't it? I mean, here we have people disagreeing at the conceptual intellectual level and yet, uh, having a feeling of solidarity and friendship that leads one to take this enormous risk of having to refund a full year's salary. Galileo, what was it like trying to get your books published? Having, well, having to get the okay the to get the books of published. That book, it, 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 Galileo at one point um, became the... Uh, the problem with Galileo is that he uh, was overconfident and uh, he probably lacked uh, 
the diplomacy that was required in, in Rome at the time, yeah. um, we, we must bear in mind that the popes uh, of that period are really members of wealthy families and are more interested in their prestige, uh, I'm saying my hat to say this, uh, than in the development of uh, a better grasp of what it means to be a Christian. So uh, they uh, were anxious to avoid conflicts inside the church. Uh, Galileo didn't quite understand the problem that some more interesting individuals had about the scripture. <laughs> so I, basically he uh, had really no, uh, I mean, he had, he had very good friends. I mean, uh, I, I only discovered recently, for instance, a cardinal called Francesco del Monte, uh, who was really anxious to help him. What yeah. really happens yeah. in this context is that uh, Galileo could uh, have avoided this if he had, had yeah. been a bit more, shall we say, reasonable. But it's nice to say that, but when you're very bright, sometimes you can be intolerant, can't you? <laughs> right. So, uh, yeah, Ari, you, you've got a few more questions here, but we do have some people who've, who are eager to ask some questions directly. That's why uh, I suggested you ask. Yeah, yeah let's, let's do that. Uh, Del Kuhn was, uh, had said he had a question he wanted to ask. Del, I think I saw you on. Is that correct? Are you... Can you unmute yourself and, and ask? Or didn't I see that? Uh, let's see, somewhere. No? Okay, maybe mistaken. Um, I, hope John, no, I hope there's no censorship here. <laughs> no, no, not this time. Not this time. John Schwartz had a question. John, I know I saw you over there. Uh, would you like to unmute yourself and... Um, See what Galileo has to say? Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Good. Uh, I'm wondering to what extent Galileo's musical training helped his scientific research. I've heard his uh, experiment with the bells, on the ball rolling down the incline and adjusting them for equal time intervals may have been the result of musical training. Is that true? No, no. You're, you're, other you're experiments absolutely you're right. You're absolutely right. His musical training, which had from his father, his father uh, taught, uh, taught music and actually wrote about it. But his father also made experiments with the length of strings and was able to see the differences and work out a number of relationships. So this practical work that Galileo did with his father on the length and the width and the weight of strings I think prepared him to make his experiments along inclined planes, or also his experiments with a pendulum to determine uh, time. So there, there is a I, I think I agree with you. There is a relationship between this uh, early training in musicology and uh, also Galileo played the lute. All the members of the family played. I mean. Uh, and he he was, I've seen this in the correspondence. I mean, uh, he and his brother, his brother perhaps more than Galileo himself, were very, very good musicians. So thank you for asking that question. Okay. Um, I don't see Dell pop back on. I think he was on and went off. When he gets back, we'll give him a chance. But uh, uh, Terry Gray says he had a question. Terry, you want to uh, jump in here? No one has been put into a sure. prison, I hope. Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> you know, the story about Galileo's prison, if I may say that, is something that had always intrigued me. May I? Sure, sure. Yes. That's fine. You know, Galileo went to prison. So when I started looking into this more closely, 
I found out that he was actually brought to the Holy Office and uh, one of the senior members was told to vacate his suite. So Galileo was given a three-room apartment with access to the garden. Uh, so that changed my view of things. So the next question I was able to, I asked and I was able to find out, I said, yes, but how did they treat him? Well, actually, they did not feed him because uh, all his meals were brought in, uh, uh, were cooked by the chef of the uh, Tuscan embassy in Rome, uh, which had the, better, the best chef in the city. <laughs> you know, these things, these things, at one point, one starts smiling. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, sorry. Yeah, no, that's great. Oh, yes. Terry. Well, I, so I wrote my question there in the chat, but uh, did Galileo consider himself to be a good Catholic or a renegade Catholic? Well, you see, uh, Galileo considered himself a Catholic, but one has to understand that where he lived, I mean, um, everyone was, uh, was a Catholic. Um, what he did have, however, was a friendship with Paolo Sarpi in Venice. And Paolo Sarpi uh, belonged to the important, very important and large group of Venetian Catholics who were sympathetic to uh, the Anglican way of handling the situation. And Sarpi wrote uh, this famous history of the Council of Trent, which is, uh, I think, one of the great masterpieces of theological literature. Uh, this was uh, written in Italian. It was banned, of course, uh, but it was uh, translated uh, in English and uh, became uh, a bestseller. Uh, and Whitehead, and this is more recent, I mean, the great philosopher from Cambridge who went to Harvard, Alfred North Whitehead, uh, once said that this was perhaps one of the five more important books that he had ever read. So Galileo was certainly belonged to um, um, the group in Venice that uh, considered themselves Catholics, but uh, somewhat along the Anglo-Catholic side, I would imagine. Uh, Venice um, um, took a different position. For instance, they expelled the Jesuits, uh, not because the Jesuits had bad schools, but because they uh, uh, obeyed the Pope in, uh, instead of uh, obeying the Patriarch of Venice. So it's a complicated mixture. Galileo certainly, um, well, he had his daughter who was a nun, a marvelous woman, but she was put in there because Galileo could not provide a dowry for her, uh, not for any religious uh, convictions. And she turned out to be a wonderful person. His second daughter was also placed in the convent. And the poor woman in this case uh, had a nervous breakdown. So, mm. so that's, yep. uh, Okay, uh, Bob Caido is next. And after that, Larry O'Toole, I think. Yeah, I uh, put a question in the chat box. Uh, one of the things that some popularizers of science have talked about in the same breath is Galileo and Giordano Bruno. I know that Carl Sagan, who loves to talk or love to talk about the persecution of scientists by the church, mentioned in the same breath, but I'm no expert on this, but I got the sense that uh, Bruno had his own issues and a lot of his rather strange views on astronomy aren't, shall we say, exactly precursors of modern science. And so I have just some questions, Galileo. Did you know the fellow? What did you think of him? And uh, do you consider himself him a colleague? And indeed, maybe making you, Galileo, the second person, second scientist who was persecuted? I'd just like your thoughts on that. Well, Giordano Bruno is a, is a major figure. Uh, um, a, a daring uh, revolutionary 
somewhat wild person <laughs> uh, who actually spent some time in England. Uh, the fact that he was taken in by the Venetians because he was denounced by the person for whom he was working, and he was kept in prison for a longish period of time, uh, then sent to Rome, and unfortunately, virtually all of the documents relating to his trial have been lost. Uh, so we are left to conjecture um, in this extraordinary thing that he was burnt at the stake in the year 1600. And uh, as you know, there's a statue erected to him that we can see to the present day in the Piazza dei Fiori in Rome. Uh, I pass in front of it at least uh, once or twice a year when the COVID allows me to do so. <laughs> and uh, one really wonders, you know, how uh, it, 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 it's it's one of these incredible tragedies. But but the man uh, was certainly convinced that he had strange views. Uh, I think that one of the things that is frequently mentioned is, of course, he, his Trinitarian views were not orthodox. So uh, Galileo avoids mentioning him. And I think this was the common view by most people at the time is uh, you can talk about it in private, but you don't bring it up. It is a source of embarrassment uh, I've been struck by the fact that uh, members of the clergy in Rome, uh, after his uh, death, they just don't talk about him. I mean, some people have written books, you know, there's always a book about uh, Giordano Bruno because he wrote so extensively. But what I see in the correspondence uh, discuss various views, uh, there seems to be a, a deliberate uh, a shame, perhaps. Uh, I, 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 I've been unable to understand why Bruno simply disappears. One doesn't want to talk about him. I mean, that's my feeling. I mean, mm -hmm. okay. Um, Larry, you want to uh, make your comment? And then I think Del Kuhn is back on. So uh, we'll give him a chance after you, Larry. You... I'm there. there we are. Okay. Um, yeah, I read your book. I, I read the uh, review, and I and I had to Thank read. You. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Uh, and I enjoyed it very much. Just meet someone who's actually read your book. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. I did. I I I I I I was when I was a kid. I was fascinated by Galileo. I I got a little telescope kit and had to make my own telescope. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, you know, so I was really interested in him as a, a child, but I never learned anything about him. So I learned more from reading your book about Galileo, even though it was a small book, uh, than, I, than I've known my whole life. Um, one thing I found interesting was um, about astrology and um, that, that he, what, what, what I, the, the impression I got was that he, he, he thought about astrology as like, well, oh, it's another science and he, and he, uh, and that's, listen, correct me if I'm wrong, which I, but I just found it interesting. I never knew anything about this until, it said, and, and, until, I, until I read the book. But um, and, oh, then the church drew a line, the line that they, they didn't have a real opinion about astrology, except that they drew a line about, well, you can't, the line you can't cross is to impact the, try to impact the future about your predictions. You can try to impact the future, uh, predict the future, but you can't think that you can impact a change on the future that you're predicting. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, um, did he really believe, and, and did, did, did he, did, my mistake, or did he think like he could do a better job predicting because uh, with his astrology, because of his use of his telescope and like picking you know, and having more astrological bodies to fine tune his predictions? Is that like out there? Or am I, did I read that correctly? Well, you know, this, it, this, this is uh, very interesting what you say, because 
uh, for many years when I started studying uh, Galileo, I was interested in his science. I was interested in his interpretation of the Bible. And I completely ignored astrology. Uh, now I have uh, been convinced <laughs> that I missed something very, very important. People really and truly believed in uh, astrology, not only in Italy, but in England. I have here, uh, I don't know if you can see a book. It's uh, John Aubrey's Brief Lives. It uh, is an important work written uh, after Galileo's death. Uh, and uh, the edition I have, I mean, it is rather fun uh, to read. Uh, but this standard edition does not have any of the horoscopes. But if you actually look at the original manuscript, for each and every person he writes about, he starts by showing their horoscope. <laughs> you know, it's fascinating to suddenly discover that what was very important for an author when talking about human beings was to know their horoscope. So Galileo actually um, criticized, of course, uh, the bad astrologers who were incompetent. Uh, but he himself made horoscopes of his children. And uh, we have these horoscopes. They've been recently, only recently published. Uh, he uses the horoscopes the way we use psychologists. Uh, I hope you all smile when I say, you see, you have children who have problems. You take them to the school psychologist. Uh, who does probably more damage than uh, well, I'm sorry, I've just voiced a prejudice. But what you did then, you went to the astrologer and Galileo, by looking at the astrological chart of his two daughters, uh, behaves in a certain way, uh, the way when we are told by the psychologist, well, uh, your daughter or your son has this particular problem, so you should handle it with uh, due caution by doing this, that, or the other. Now, uh, this is not an attack on psychology. It's a vindication of astrology. <laughs> and it uh, extends even to, uh, as I, I just showed you in England, I mean, uh, I mean the, the, the fact that that had been removed completely, I mean, I missed it for years. The Pope... Uh, Barberini, who became Urban VIII uh, and condemned Galileo, was himself advised by a professional astrologer to the extent of inside the uh, residence of the Pope, there was a room that was decorated with a ceiling with all the planets, and he would go in there with his uh, advisor uh, who uh, would light candles and perform a certain number of rites to protect the Pope from uh, what would be unfortunate sequels to uh, the astrological chart that he had just made. Astonishing, isn't it? <laughs> but everyone knew this. For instance, I, I found out in the correspondence set by the uh, ambassadors from Venice to, uh, to I mean, the Venetian ambassadors would send coded messages to Venice. Uh, and you were going to ask me how I could read the coded letters. Well, fortunately, the secretary who received the coded message <laughs> would write between the lines and the code, the decoded message. So one can actually read nowadays those documents. But you're absolutely right. People believed in that until, what, until uh, 2020? It's incredible. <laughs> uh, just before, I think Del Kuhn is back on, right? Uh, and yeah. just, be, just before we go to Del, just want to say I'm delighted that Owen Gingrich could join us. 
Uh, he just joined us. I don't know if you've met him. I know you know him, Bill, uh, but another historian and, and uh, who remembers you. At any rate, uh, uh, welcome here, Owen. Uh, at any rate, uh, Dell, you've got a question for uh, Galileo here. You want to yes, comment? Yes I, yes, I do. I'm assuming my mic is on because the little light went on. I also read your book, and thank you, and I'm looking forward to getting the uh, missing 15 minutes of our talk. The astrology aspect kind of led me into one, two thoughts. One is that Galileo is different than us in his internal thinking. But more importantly, or more interestingly, is the two books, Scripture and Nature. We, you know, 21st century, tend to take that for granted if we're Christians. But I just wonder, when you introduced that, was it really one book, Scripture, and were you introducing the second book, Nature Written in Mathematics, as also, underlying also, a valid way to get knowledge. Yes, well, I mean, the great importance of Galileo in the history of science is that he was able to combine mathematical and knowledge with practical physical experiments. I mean, the determination of the speed related to time, the time squared law, that we all learn in high school uh, was determined by Galileo. Now, what I also discovered is that Galileo got this idea of the inclined plane from someone called Guido Baldo del Monte, whom he visited in Urbino. So that's interesting to know that already before Galileo, there were a number of people trying to determine this law and so this f fundamental law, um, the Times Square law, uh, opened up uh, investigations that led to Newton's theory of gravitation. Uh, Newton, by the way, because he knew that Galileo had formulated this law, was convinced that Galileo uh, knew his own law of attraction and his argument was, if I was able to deduce this, Galileo, who was as intelligent as I am, must have done it. I don't know if you're convinced by this argument. <laughs> okay. I, I, I guess my question I, was, was Galileo the first to add nature to scripture as getting valid knowledge? Or is he in a tradition that we're not really aware of simply because we quote him all the time? No, that nature, I think there was a long tradition of, uh, uh, of nature, you know, uh, being a source of knowledge. Uh, the, 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 the problem with Galileo is when there is a conflict between uh, literal interpretation of the Bible and a clear scientific law, uh, who is going to win? Uh, so uh, I think it's a question that uh, has not disappeared entirely from a number of uh, issues. I mean, we won't have to... Uh, the, the, the dialogue uh, should go on, I think. Yeah. Not the warfare. Great. Right. Okay. Uh, did you have a second part to that, Dell, or that was it? Okay. Uh, Paul Carr had uh, raised up, and after that, uh, Gordon Fish. Yes. Uh, is it true that uh, you know Gal we all know that Galileo strongly supported Copernicus that the sun was the center of the solar system? Um, is it true? Some people claim that he he was so convinced that he. He wanted to convince the church. He felt that the church was on the wrong side by not going along with this. And he, he wanted to bring the church around to, to, to actually adopt the Copernicus system that he was so enthusiastic about. Yes, I mean, I, I, he does say that uh, it, it is very unfortunate that the church should maintain um, a position that uh, has been demonstrated to be uh, wrong. Uh, that the earth is at rest. 
the only problem is that Galileo did not prove that the earth <laughs> was in motion. Uh, as you may remember in the dialogue on the two greatest world systems, he gives his main argument in the fourth day. And, uh, you know, after producing circumstantial evidence that is very weighty indeed, he said, now my proof is that the tides would not be possible if the earth did not rotate on its axis and uh, revolve around the sun. Now, uh, that's not a good argument, uh, but the fact that it was known by some of his contemporaries to be completely unsatisfactory. Um, see, this is the problem. If uh, eventually uh, all Christians came to believe that the earth rotates on its axis, um, but uh, I sometimes ask my students, if we are rotating on an axis, how come we don't lose our clouds? And the answer is usually, well, this doesn't belong to this course, but to another <laughs> course. <laughs> okay. Um, Gordon? Gordon, you were done. There we okay. go. I, there you go. All right. Good. At some point along the way, I've come to understand that perhaps the problem that Galileo got into trouble with the church over was not so much heliocentricity, but the but the implications that that would have for other other doctrines of the church, like transubstantiation. And given that this is a, a period of history when the fight with the reformed with the Protestant Reformation was was in heat. Um, th the thought was that that he was he was sort of taking away their argument for for their view of of the Eucharist, and so that he had to be he had to be put down for that reason as much as for heliocentricity. Can you can you comment about that? Is that is yes, that a correct yeah, historical right. understanding? That, how that, important uh, is it? You see, this uh, Galileo believed in atoms. And an a a atomism was a, was, a, was a problem in the interpretation of uh, transubstantiation. Um, so, I mean, that you, you could make a case if you're using Aristotelian uh, categories, um, you will not be using atomic uh, concepts. And uh, yes, he is criticized uh, not for dealing with this directly, but uh, that his uh, atomic theory, shared by many others, I mean, um, was um, was dangerous. Yes, I, I I don't think they worried very much about that. The condemnation of atomism uh, by the Roman uh, Church comes later, comes after Descartes. So. But it is there. I mean, the, the, that that is mentioned. Yes. I mean, of course, it's a you know transubstantiation, consubstantiation, or you have you know, Zwingli's uh, even more liberal interpretation. But it's it's difficult for us to enter into the psychology of. Uh, the people who are arguing about this at the time. It's not, uh, it's not an issue that is alive, mm -hmm. as far as I can see. Yes. Okay. Um, we have the same question from both Terry Gray and Judy Taranchuk. And since Terry's already asked one, Judy, you want to put that on the table? Uh, well, you mentioned that... Uh that Galileo had some interesting views on the plague and on social distancing. And that, of course, is very relevant to our situation today. So could you tell us more about that? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? Uh, uh, you mentioned in the review that Galileo had some interesting views on the plague and on social distancing. And because that's so <laughs> relevant to our situation today. Yes, yes, yes actually, this is an interesting point. Thank you for mentioning it. Yes, I mean, they, 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 quarantine was introduced by the Venetians 
several years before this terrible a plague that came down from Germany when the troops came in and brought it in. And so one of the um, ideas was that social distancing was very important. It was controversial, but Galileo seems to have you know, applied it himself with the members of his families because actually his gardener died of the plague. And uh, so he, he avoided going to see uh, people outside his house. And uh, this was encouraged by, I would say, the vast majority of physicians at the time. They didn't know what caused it, but they knew that infection was dangerous and therefore would urge people not to travel, for instance. Uh, many uh, left Florence to go outside what is remarkable is that the Grand Duke and his brothers stayed in Florence. The Grand Duke declared that since they were the head of state, they should remain in the city. And uh, it was uh, psychologically, that was an important component and gave people a certain feeling that the Grand Duke and the family cared for them. Actually, they were. Uh, I mean, they took enormous risks. Uh, and to the best of my knowledge, they didn't get the plague or the COVID-19, or should I say now COVID-20 or 21. <laughs> yes, right. you're right. Yeah. They, they, were, they were aware of these problems. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I don't know well, if they wore a mask. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, perhaps of a different design. Uh, Ron Myers, you had a question you want to put out there? Yeah, got to unmute. I'm unmuted. Um, there seems to be implied and in, in explicit charges against Galileo. What was the complete list of these things, both explicitly stated and implied that the church was mad at him about? Could you? Uh, yeah, he, he, he's, he's, yeah his, his audio feed's a little poor. He's asking what is the complete list of stated and unstated charges that the church brought against Galileo? Well, I mean, the, the Galileo was accused of having uh, presented as demonstrated something that was not demonstrated. And if you present something about the Christian dogma uh, and you have no valid arguments, then you're in trouble. Um, unfortunately, as the church could uh, simply condemn this, Galileo, of course, uh, uh, was wise enough at the end to uh, uh, admit uh, <laughs> I have another two minutes to say what he actually did at the end. Sure, you know, the, go ahead. Say the trial, the trial is not, you know, what, not what we think is a trial. The trial was made in the presence of three persons, Galileo, a Dominican, and the secretary. They were actually the three persons in a room. There was no other trial. Uh, so he, he suggested to the Dominican who was in charge, he said, look, I mean, I... I realized that I have exaggerated. You know, I was enthusiastic, too ambitious. I said that I had demonstrated that the earth rotates and moves around the sun. It was an overstatement. So I'm sorry about that. Now, what I think I would like to do, if you will do this, we will publish a new edition of my book for the fifth day. And then that fifth day, I will explain why people misunderstood me. At this point, <laughs> there was no answer. <laughs> I mean, we have the full record. So after he made this statement, <laughs> that was the end of the trial. And of course, I mean, they, I would imagine the Dominican who was in charge just smiled and smiled. Uh, after that, he was, uh, interestingly enough, he was able to leave immediately his uh, 
his apartment in the Vatican and go back to the Tuscan embassy in Rome. And then he was invited by a bishop who was not a friend of the Pope uh, to go to Siena. But nonetheless, Galileo was under house arrest for the rest of his life. By house arrest, it means that uh, he could go to church on Sundays, he could have dinner with uh, friends, but never more than 12 persons at a time. A strange world, isn't it? Like today's social distancing world. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But the 12, you know, it's, it's, you read these things and you say, well, I mean, were they serious? So right. I'm sure they yeah. were to some extent. <laughs> We can have a few more questions, I think, because this is a, a very stimulating conversation. Uh, Craig Story, you had a question here. you want to put that out? Um, sure. Uh, I, I realize this is maybe a little off topic because Galileo is known for astronomy and so on, but did anyone in his time address the nature of living matter? I know you and um, uh, Owen have read a lot of his writings and like, what did people then think? Did they even consider that as a distinctive thing? Um, for example, Erwin Schrodinger wrote What is Life? And physicists uh, began wondering about that issue at a later time. But some of the first biology things we talk about are in the 1800s, you know, much later. So I wonder if you could talk about what people thought back then, if you ran across anything about that. No, it is remarkable that people believe that the uh, uh, Earth was uh, five or 6,000 years old. At one point, I did some research in that, and I was absolutely astonished to find the number of books that were published. But they all say it's uh, 4,000, 5,000, or 6,000 years. But the, the, the debate was about this period. I mean, this to us is, is just ridiculous. I mean, the time span. No, basically, because, uh, well, the creation was assumed to be. Uh, I, I'm, I'm more well, thinking of... And, 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 I mean, there, there's really nothing interesting in these books. I mean, I spent, you know, a few hours looking at several of them, and I, I was just amazed that it was, therefore, a discussion, but a discussion that was irrelevant to the kind of concerns that we have. I, I'm more concerned with thinking about, like, the nature of living material, like a living thing versus a rock, say. Like, did they discuss... Well, that, that. that's absolutely straightforward. God created it that way. And, uh, yeah, you know, I mean, they, uh, even I have seen little discussion about the rib. Mm. Yeah. As you say, I mean, it's quite a feat to uh, uh, <laughs> do it that way. Mm -hmm. Okay. It doesn't, it doesn't, Galileo doesn't discuss it. Uh, uh, the theologians he uh, discussed, they, they, they simply taken this as granted. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Ari, you have, um, you want to wrap up here with a few more questions just to make sure we've covered everything? Uh, yeah, I, I want to ask one further question. There are many, many myths about Galileo. And one of them was, about the trial, and you clarify that. Are there others that are in the literature that you know are not true? The sort of Galileo myths. Yes. For example, the Tower of Pisa. Yes, yeah, no, no, it was very important when you are fighting uh, I mean, uh, people who were convinced that uh, mankind would not progress unless we got rid of religion. Uh, it's marvelous to find uh, someone like Galileo who was clobbered uh, for a scientific discovery, I mean, to use him. Um, I don't, I, as I said, uh, the, the church, uh, to the best of my knowledge, after that learned that you don't condemn scientists, even if you're not in agreement. <laughs> it's just too dangerous. You're putting arms in the hands of opponents. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, I'd like to exercise my prerogative and ask one question before we end. Uh, you alluded to this before, but there is 
Galileo's focus on the tides, his explanation for the tides, which, uh, if I understand it correctly, there were uh, contemporary colleagues of his at the time that uh, uh, taught specifically the tides were due to the moon, and Galileo disagreed. Why? Why was it? Did did he really think he had evidence for tides, or was it that his idea of tides supported his his uh, idea that the Earth moved, and he clung to it for that reason, or why was he so strong on his own view of the tides, which turned out to be wrong? Yeah, you know, it, it is it is something of a puzzle uh, why he clung to this. Uh, uh, what is little known is that at the end of his life, he abandoned the time explanation and he did. reverted to uh, an explanation. <laughs> using the moon. But this was published in a letter written four years before he died. And although it is published in the 20 volume edition of his works, uh, that reference is not in the index. Whoever made the index uh, forgot to insert that. So when people look up Galileo, they look up the index, the moon, the tides, and uh, I, I claim to have found that text, <laughs> which I published. Um, but it's interesting that, uh, as you say, I mean, the flaws are fairly obvious. Even. But the fact that he should re return to that traditional idea of the importance of the moon is, is interesting. Right? Mm. At That's least I great. think so. <laughs> right. Thank you well, very much. It's really been for me a great privilege and an honor to spend part of the afternoon with you. This is great. And it's evening where you are, I believe, by now. So, uh, yes, but it's uh, <laughs> now uh, quite close, now nine o'clock. Nine o'clock, a little after nine. That's great. Well, I want to thank you uh, for uh, sharing this time with us. Thank you for all the books you've written on Galileo and Ari, thank you for drawing our attention to this wonderful book. I did get the Kindle version and, and uh, enjoyed reading that. It's it's just and a marvelous I'll little. And I want to thank Ari again for his lovely review. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Thanks, Bill. I okay. would like to review all of my books. <laughs> right. That's great. You can do that. And I'd, I'd like to I'd like to thank all the rest of you for joining us, and I hope you enjoyed the conversation. And uh, we'll see you next on um, March thirteenth. Very well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Bye, everybody. Bye -bye. See ya. Bye.